hello, you bearded bastards, and welcome back once again to Idrath Kor Irol Sazir. Treasure Cavern. The North Bridge. Rather, that's the formal name anyways. You may have noticed the dwarves have taken to calling the place North Bridge. Rolls off the tongue a bit easier. Right at the current time, it's the 11th of Hematite, early summer of 109. So we've been here just over a year, for the most part, a year in a season, and I'd say we're doing pretty darn well. Our population right now is 26, and we're hanging in there, starting to try to get things balanced out a bit better. We do have enough food and drinks for everyone, no problem at all. Though it is mostly a vegetarian diet, we'll have to remedy that at some point, and we are still working on bedrooms for all the dwarves too. Gotta make them nice and comfy. Goes without saying, I suppose. Anywho, on to our fortress projects. Well, actually, before we get to that, it appears we might have some visitors. And having a look over to our west, we can see some human traders have arrived with their elephants. That's fascinating. Okay, I suppose we should have been a bit more prepared for this, but we certainly are not. In fact, I don't think we have anything to trade currently. We'll have to whip something up quickly. We have to make a good impression on these guys. Ah, uh, yes, uh, come on in, get set up, and we'll work on something promptly. We're gonna have Amost here go down and start taking pieces of that bell that are smashed all over the floor and turn them into some crafts. Just real, real quick. And actually, the Dwarven merchants are gonna be arriving next season, so, uh, yeah, we'll probably have her working on these until then. Any good luck to you, work quickly, my friend. And while she makes up some crafts, let's take a look at our fortress projects like we were going to do. Having a look outside, we have the main project, the North Bridge itself. And isn't it looking stunning right now? I think we started work proper on this thing around the beginning of autumn last year, so we haven't even been working for a year yet. That's pretty darn good. We have about 100 claystone blocks to toy around with right at the moment, and we're gonna be making up some more, but it's only gonna be a couple more loads till we're entirely across this span. Not too shabby, huh? We're really hoping to hit the opposite side before we get to the one year mark, and we're certainly hoping to do it before winter, because remember, we have to get underneath and start working those supports too. That's gonna be very important with all the foot traffic, of course, especially seeing as how the humans are bringing elephants with them. That's a lot of weight there. Goodness gracious, we are picking away at it though. We'll be there soon enough. Speaking of one year mark, I think I'd mentioned it that because we've been here for more than a year so far, I'm growing increasingly concerned about our defenses or lack thereof. Something's bound to have noticed us by now. Of course, we have the goblins nearby, but then underground, you never know what you can expect to see. Giant cave spiders, blind cave ogres, all kinds of terrible stuff down there. And don't even get me started with the beasts. Hoping it doesn't come to that, but I'm sure it will at some point. That being said, as for our defenses, we don't really have all that much right at the moment, except for these four cage traps down here next to a flimsy wooden door. Our giant cave toads, I thought maybe we can use them for defense in some fashion, but these two that we have trained up aren't really in a hurry to breed, which, well, it's a shame. I'm sure it'll pick up at some point, but not something we could rely on yet. That being said, I did mention that we had a locum make up a full suit of iron armor for one of our dwarves, as well as a spear. Those there would be great armaments for a military dwarf. We are very impressed with his skill and have decided to start pumping out some more armor and spears. We're gonna start out with five sets and they're not made quite yet, but once they are, we're gonna set up a proper barracks and get to training some of our dwarves for combat. That's very important. It's one thing to be able to defend our dwarves by locking up the gates and staying inside, but it's another thing entirely to be able to fend off threats so we don't have to worry about that big hassle of locking ourselves up inside and not having access to traitors. We can't do that. We have to be able to fight for wealth's sake and for Idrath too, of course. We must be strong. Uh, but yes, back to the matter at hand, the traders. Now, we're going to go through this thing pretty quickly here. Just because we're going to be doing an awful lot of trading, we have to be able to make this whole process be efficient. Can't really go into full detail every single time we trade, you know? It'll get a bit tedious. And so, yes, quick now. Okay, there we go. Excellent doing business with you. We managed to get for ourselves a whole bunch of food just there. A lot of meat, a lot of fish. And we also got a bunch of cloth and leather, too, stuff we didn't really have. And in turn, we traded a bunch of freshly made platinum crafts as well as a wooden table we had laying around. It got the job done. And once again, we are pretty much out of things to trade. We'll have to make some more quickly. We also had a brief meeting with the Merchant's Guild envoy who arrived. These humans here are from the Empire of Dales, the nearest human civilization to us. They march under the banner of the Kobold Bulbs. Quite distinct, they have a very unique culture. We'll have to try our best to ingratiate ourselves to them, and I think we're off to a good start. We requested next year that they bring some more leather, as well as elephants male and female. We would like to get our hands on those as well. It'd be great if we can get a herd of our own. One day, one day. Anyways, yes, again, humans. Great doing business with you, and we'll have some better stuff to trade next year for sure. Safe travels to you. 
Now back to fortress matters, and primarily our bridge, which I'm getting very excited about. As you can see, we're nearly at the other side. We are probably gonna have to make a small stairway over here before we do anything, just because we'll need to clear away some of these trees if we're going to continue the bridge. That's not a big deal though. It's really good news that we're almost done with this damn bridge too, because I've been realizing how far the dwarves have to travel in order to put the new blocks in place. It's quite a journey from one side all the way over across, and the whole time they're out here in the beating sun or the freezing rain, it's not the most pleasant thing, and I think it is actually a bit detrimental for some of our dwarves. I'm noticing a lot more unhappy faces than I'd like to see. With any luck, we'll be done with it before long, in no small part due to the fact we have some extra help here now, another migrant wave has arrived. Which is great, more beards will make it go quicker. But in addition to that, now that we have some more dwarves, and the armor and weapons I was telling you about, we're gonna start working on a military. We have five dwarves in a squad right now, they're calling themselves the Salt Bridge Squad, and they're being headed up by Moses. He's one of the first Nocortorad dwarves who showed up here, and he's a pretty skilled tactician, surprisingly. So we figured we'd give him the job, he doesn't really know how to fight all too well, but he might be able to give some guidance to the other dwarves here. You can see we have a little spot for them down here in the mines. This is actually directly underneath where that bell crashed down, hence all the platinum fragments scattered around. This is going to be a perfectly serviceable barracks for now. And with any luck before long, they'll be trained up and able to fight. I think it's going to work out pretty darn well, actually. Good luck, you dwarves. Train them well, Moses. Oh my goodness, and things are speeding right along. We've just rolled over into autumn, and the dwarven traders have arrived once more. But luckily this time, unlike with the humans, we have plenty to trade with them. We've pumped out a ton of platinum crafts. So I'm not too worried about it. We're gonna do some more great deals this year. Just hoping they brought a lot. Let's have a look. Okay, yes, we were able to get quite a bit from them. And still, they brought even more than we expected. We couldn't get everything we wanted, which is a good problem to have. We traded away every single one of our platinum crafts. And in turn, we got a bunch of food again, and a bunch of cloth, and a bunch of leather. Really, I'd prefer to just trade for food rather than producing it here at the fortress, just because we have so many things to tend to. The bridge, primarily. And we also managed to get some gold bars, too. We don't have access to gold yet here, but I'm hoping we find some eventually. I'm not too sure. No matter. Yes, it was a pretty good deal overall, but that's not all that came out of this meeting. The outpost liaison spoke with Vabok, and apparently our little fortress here has been making waves. The outpost liaison has approached us empowered to establish our colony here as an official land of the Lancer of Oiling. That's very exciting. We'll start getting wagons for trade now. There's going to be more responsibilities, of course, but I'm sure it'll be fine. This will be good for us. Only thing is that we need to choose a baron to rule over the place. And well, again, with merit comes reward, right? The only suitable dwarf we have in the fortress that Vabok feels is suitable is himself. And you gotta give it to the guy. He's been running a damn fine fortress so far. I think you'd make a great baron. You deserve it, Vabok. Enjoy this, my friend. We'll consider it one of many steps in your meteoric rise to power. Such good luck. Truly, we have been blessed. Oh, and you know what? It makes sense now. We just had a reported sighting. We didn't really manage to see the thing, but... Well, let's just say we can expect to continue being lucky. We're blessed by the Crag children, it seems. We'll have to start building a shrine immediately. Actually, those gold bars we got would be great for it. Yeah, we're gonna get straight to it. The news just keeps getting better and better these days for Vabok. This guy's probably having the best time of his life, really. We have more and more dwarves in the fortress. We just had a migrant wave, brought us up to 42 dwarves. This fortress, his fortress, the one he founded, is looking stellar. Good trades, making good relations with our neighbors. And on top of that, Vabok here now has a girlfriend, Aitan the Farmer, one of the dwarves who came here alongside him. It's kind of surprising to see, because, well, they haven't really had that much time to interact. I think they're going to do pretty darn well together, and really, well, Personally speaking, I don't, um, know what Aitan sees in the guy. <laughs> they don't really seem to be all that similar is what I'm trying to say, you know? Aitan's kind of a bubbly dwarf, very personable, and, you know, Fabok here is, uh, well, you know, <laughs> intolerant of other cultures and, uh, maybe a bit greedy, but that beard, my goodness, it's, uh, it really is something. He's a unique specimen, I could say that much. But you know, I guess all that matters is that they found each other, they seem to really like each other, and I'm hoping they continue to form their relationship, and I'm just glad to see happy dwarves, really. Everyone here in the fortress is doing good, and that is just excellent to see. Keep it up, Vabok, and you too, Aitan. You're doing great. Anyways, having a look at the date, right now it's the 13th of Timber, late autumn of 109, which means winter is swiftly approaching. The sea will soon be frozen again. And before that happens, we have a lot of construction to get done here on the bridge. So right at the moment, we have all hands on deck. We were kind of busy down in the fortress, smoothing up some rooms down there, but we have to finish up this surface bridge work before the snows fly. We only have a small window of time to get those supports in. But yes, as you can see, we are looking pretty darn good. 
actually over here in the middle of the bridge, we've started work on a, sort of a heart of the bridge, if you will. This right here is going to serve as the main entrance to our fortress. Maybe a place to put a trade depot, something like that. An entryway, in a manner of speaking. Still has a ways to go, of course. It's going to take an awful lot of planning to figure out where we're going to put these dwarves on the bridge itself. But we have some ideas. Just kind of taking things one step at a time. And actually having a look across the way, you can see the other side of the bridge. We're almost there. Just going to try to finish up this last bit from both ends. Make it quicker, you know? We'll get there before long, but probably not before the sea freezes. That's okay, though. I'm sure it'll be done by this time next year. In fact, we probably won't even recognize this bridge anymore. Exciting. <gasps> Ooh. By Idrath's Gold. Do you see that right there? <gasps> it's one of the craggy children we've been blessed again. And this time we actually get to see it too. Oh, that's gotta be very good luck there. If you're not familiar with what this is exactly, it's a, uh, it's a kobold. A small squat humanoid with large pointy ears and yellow glowing eyes. And we are extremely fortunate to be witnessing this one here, so close to the fortress too. Some dwarves like kobolds for their mischief, and they do create an awful lot of mischief too. They like to sneak in, see where they can get, and take things. They've got a great propensity for stealing things from a fortress, but that's fine. The luck they bestow is well worth a couple trinkets. It's heading away now, probably back to its secretive settlement wherever that is. They're such flighty creatures, but I'm sure we can expect to see them again. We can hope so anyways. And in the meantime, we have to put the finishing touches on the kobold shrine. Remember, I mentioned we were making one. And doo -doo -doo, there it is right there. We just finished it up. As you can see, it's a nice stone platform here with golden pillars holding up a roof above. An applewood roof. Nice little safe spot for the kobolds to come and rest if they need to. We also have an inviting statue in there of a kobold. Just kind of meditating. As you can see off to the side there, we have a stack of coins as well that they can take. It's an offering to them. Again, they frequently come into fortresses just to see what they could take and... Well, those little mischief makers can be a little dangerous sometimes, so it might be a good idea to just, you know, put a couple things from the snag out here in the forest. Again, they're beneficial, highly beneficial. This is a good thing, and I'm glad we got this shrine made for them. We'll have to keep eyes on this coin here to see if it ever gets taken. I do hope they come for it. Ah, but yes, as you can see over here, it has just started snowing and these ponds have frozen. And yes, in fact, the entire ocean is now frozen. And also as a side note, you can see our span is finished too. Not too bad, dwarves. Damn fine work. Ah, yes. Now we're going to begin work on the supports down below. We have to get that done as fast as we can. Of course, it's not a very straightforward process at all. We have to carve these stairways down through the ice, down to the sea floor. That way we can see how long the supports need to be. It's kind of a guessing game in a lot of ways. Luckily though, I did make up a plan of last year and where we need to build supports still, so it's not that much of a guessing game. We just have to fill in the blanks pretty much. Though I will say it is kind of a giant pain to deal with the ice down here. Some of the seawater has not frozen yet. It could be a little risky too, having your miners go down and dig away some ice and like have water flow in around them. It might freeze, kill them that way. But we're being careful, hasn't been a problem yet. There we go, looking good dwarves. Get those rocks in place and be careful. We haven't lost anyone yet. We're doing well. Another thing I was very careful to note is when the sea thaws. The 11th of Obsidian, late winter. So all in all, we don't have that much time, but we'll see what we can get done. And you know, in addition to those supports, I would also like to try to get another little um structure built over here, kind of like a tower jutting out of the sea. If we're going to be living out in this bridge, we still have to be able to access the underground, you know? So if we can wall off a safe little area that the sea can't flow into, then we might be able to do that, you know? I'm not sure we'll have enough time or stones, though. We did have a lot of stone, but it's going quickly, and we're going to need a lot. We'll see, though. Okay, time's moving forward, and we're trying to get down to the bottom of the sea floor over at this tower thing, and it's not going well. It's a little bit farther down than I thought it would be, but we have about a month left. I'm not sure if that'll be enough time, but <laughs> we're going to find out soon enough. We're going to start at the lowest level of the tower and dig away these walls and start putting some claystone blocks in place. Again, we're getting kind of low on the blocks and we don't have much claystone left to spare. So if we can't finish the walls with stone, we'll just do it with wood or something. We could just replace it down the line. I'm realizing that if we don't get this thing finished now, in one fell swoop, it'll get filled with seawater. That'd ruin the entire project. So let's hop to it, dwarves. Okay, here they come. Let's go, let's go. We have to work quick, my dwarves. The stress levels are rising. We're carving away the center of the tower too, because we have to pull all that ice out so it doesn't turn back to water inside the tower. It's going well so far though. We're progressing rather quickly. Now, the reason we want to put this tunnel over here, away from the main fortress area, is just as a little precaution. It'd be nice to have a barrier between us and a tunnel down to underground. 
just in case something happened, you know? Not that I'm planning to do very much between here and our main fortress yet, but it'll give us options. And yes, we did have to switch to using wood down here. That's fine though. It's gonna get the job done well enough. We just have to get this thing built. And there we have it. That should keep most of the water out, I'm thinking. I don't know if these stairways will turn back into water. I, well, they're made out of ice, so they might very well turn back into water. We'll try to get them carved away just to be safe. We don't want it too wet in there. But regardless, I think we're looking pretty good. We'll get it finished up proper next year. And in the meantime, we'll also get some more claystone blocks made too. A lot of them as well. We're gonna have to. Okay, we're progressing along nicely. And right now it's the 28th of Opal. We don't have that much time left, but it should be enough. Should be enough. We're going very quick with this project. Having a look up above the sea, we did make another layer of the tower out of stone. So now there should be no risk of water getting inside. We're safe there. Keeping a very close eye on the date. Right now it's the 6th of Obsidian. We only have about 5 days left before that thaw. Playing a risky game here, but I think it's gonna be alright. The last of the dwarves are getting off the ice right now. And we should be pretty much good to go. We should be all safe, I'm thinking. Tower's looking good. We didn't get any new supports put on the bridge. Which is terrible, but we did finish up those ones we had in place. That's okay though. We had some bigger things to take care of. And there will be more winters, so no worries. I suppose it is more important we get established here on the bridge more than anything. Here we go, it's the 10th of Obsidian, and the 11th. Oh, okay, there it goes. Halfway through the 11th is when it thaws, apparently. Yeah, I did see, too, a bunch of water just float into the uh, tower down there. I think from the staircases that we did not dig away yet. Let's check the damage. Well, the tower is mostly clear. Just down at the very bottom, there's a very shallow layer of water. That won't be a problem, though. We'll get it dug away next year. Easy. And, uh, yeah. So, there we have it. A nice way to get underground. Wonderful. As you can see, we've already constructed a bridge to get over there. Just that easy. Now, having a look below ground, you can see this section of cavern right here. It's pretty wild. We have a bunch of fungus trees and just fungus on the ground, too. And a lot of tower caps down this way here kind of growing out in this water. And as you can see, we have some dwarves at work over this way here carving out some stone. And you might wonder why we're having some dwarves work on this random section of tunnel right here, but it's because this area is right beneath that tower we built. And we can see Cybrek here carving the staircase. This will lead right up into the tower itself, where there is some water, remember. Hopefully it goes all right. And almost there. Oh, there she goes. Okay, yeah, the water came down, kind of just splashed all over her and flowed out into the area. I guess there was an all right amount of water in there, huh? Not anymore, though. And yes, having a look up into the tower, the water is draining out swiftly. Okay, now I'm having a look at this area right here, and it looks like there's a lot of conglomerate stone, which is brown. It'd go well with the claystone up top. I am thinking that because we have to centralize production, make things as quick as possible, we might start switching over. I'm not sure. I don't know. We'll play it by ear. For now, though, we're just going to keep cleaning this area out. Gotta make it as spacious as possible, you know. Very important. And while the miners do that, I should probably show off some other areas of the fortress we haven't seen in a while. Down here you can see we have a nice quarters dug out for all our dwarves. There are 50 rooms on this floor, with a meeting hall in the center. It's all looking very nice, too. The dwarves are busy at work engraving all the surfaces right now. And remember, these are just going to be temporary bedrooms, but still, we don't know the exact definition of temporary. Trying to make them as nice as possible, just so we can make the dwarves as happy as can be. We do have 50 more bedrooms, too, planned out in this mine. They're not finished yet, and they're just kind of scattered throughout this whole level. Not the prettiest layout, but it'll get the job done fine. Oh, and actually, up this way here, you can see another extremely well-appointed bedroom. We're just getting the walls engraved now, or trying to at least. Uh, but this is actually a bedroom, a dining room, an office, and a tomb, all for Vabok. Because he's a baron now, he has a higher standard of living than the other dwarves. So we're making sure all of his needs are completely filled. I'll tell you, he's one happy dwarf, that's for sure. Not too sure why somebody wanted to put a statue of a water buffalo next to his tomb, but it's there. Oh, and that's interesting, actually. We could see there's somebody in Vabok's office having a meeting. It's a diplomat. An elven diplomat. Very interesting. We haven't met with the elves yet. Let's see what they want. Forgeborn beardling. The natural course has bade that I venture into your dank pit. You have disrespected the trees in this area. But this is what we have come to expect from your stunted kind. Further abuse cannot be tolerated. Let this be a warning to you, little dirt dweller. Oh, that's fun. <sighs> well, trying my hardest to restrain my dwarven urge to murder. 
I don't know who they think they are coming into our fortress and telling us we can't cut down these trees. It's, I mean, it's our fortress. Seems pretty rude, honestly. Like, we don't go stomping into their bramble patch telling them not to touch the stone, right? Live and let live, that's what we're saying. Well, it's a shame. I was really hoping to do some trading with the elves, but from the sounds of it, they don't want much to do with us. Yeah, it's a damn shame. But what can I say? We need these resources. They can still come to trade if they want. We'd love to see what they have to offer, but... If they think we're going to stop cutting down trees for one second, then they're out of their minds. Oh, that's a surprise. It looks like that envoy maybe came as a uh, bit of a primer for the elven merchants, which have just arrived, as you can see here, with elephants, just like the humans. Yes, we uh, seem to have a pair of them, and they no doubt brought some interesting items. Um, yes, we're going to trade with them. I'm sure they have some stuff we can use, and we'd be silly to not take advantage of this. So that's exactly what we're going to do, but again... We don't intend on ever limiting our tree cutting. I don't think. Anyways, for now, though, we'll take part in this trade, see what we can get, and continue hoping our relations don't sour too swiftly. Okay, that went pretty well, actually. We traded away a bunch of platinum stuff, like usual. Coins, as well as an accidental statue we made. And also a couple bits of stone furniture, too. And in turn, we got a bunch of plants, a lot of nuts, as well as a couple other wooden crafts they brought with them. Nothing too spectacular, just a little, um good faith trade or something. We wanted to seem like we were pretty interested in what they had, you know? But there were a couple items we were actually interested in. The elves brought a jaguar, a female jaguar, as well as a giant mandrill. And I mean, come on, we had to get those, right? I'm not sure we'll be able to do much with them, but there could be no denying that they're interesting, to say the very least. I I'm not <laughs> we just wanted them. That being said, now we're kind of invested with elven trades at the moment anyways. Hoping they bring more animals next year, including mates for these two. Imagine if we had more giant mandrills. Well, I'm glad to see we're kind of repairing relations with the elves. I do not think things are going to stay so, uh, friendly for very long. But we'll maintain it as long as we can. It'll be for the best. Anywho, back to the fortress. And, you know, we just got a report that this dwarf down here, one of the new migrants from Nakortabad, Kubuk is the name, a stone worker, has entered a strange mood. You can see he's already going straight to work. He's claimed a workshop, and he's brought two hunks of hematite in already. And he's off to get more. We'll just give him a bit, see what he does. We have plenty of resources here in the fortress, so I'm pretty confident he's going to be successful. In fact, I can almost guarantee it. And uh, while he does that, in the meantime... This giant mandrill here, it's described as being a large monster in the form of a mandrill, which is itself described as a large monkey with a blue face and rump. It lives in large groups and often survives by destroying crops and stealing garbage. The males are larger with powerful jaws. Surely a mandrill by itself is, a uh, you know, a little imposing looking. But this giant one here is, well, it's bigger than a grizzly bear. <laughs> and these things are also intelligent enough to be trained for war or hunting which makes them very useful indeed. I would dearly love to get a whole bunch of these things around the fortress. And I'm thinking for now, maybe we should come up with a good place for it. Seems kind of silly to set aside an area for the mandrill when our dwarves don't have homes on the bridge yet, but eh, it'll be a quick thing. This looks like a fine spot down here. Yes, we're going to be putting the mandrill down in the caves, but it'll be fine. We originally wanted to do a big cage up above ground, but that would take way too much time and effort. We got bigger things to worry about, and down here it's it's kind of nice and cozy. You know, we're going to get them all walled in. Got some nice fungus trees in there. We're going to make sure it's nice and safe and totally comfortable too. And hell, maybe we'll throw the jaguar in for some company as well. That might be nice. Speaking of making our animals comfortable, up here with the giant cave toads, we also tried to help them out a bit by making a pit around the outer edge. And you can see that's now filled in with water too. That kind of just leaked in from the cave walls. Works out pretty darn well, I'd say. Though still, not seeing any young toadlets anywhere. A cry and shame for sure, but... It's gonna keep giving him some time. Who knows? Anyways, back over this way here, it looks like Kubuk, the stone worker, has everything he needs for his artifact. Pretty simple items, really. But regardless, I'm eager to see what he does with them. Let's give him a moment. Oh, there we go. Kubuk Turadushvir, the stone worker, has created Ilraldal, a hematite door. He offers it to the wealthy order. Another supremely crafted artifact door. That is fantastic. Maybe not as fancy as that platinum one, but this one looks very, very interesting. Let's have a closer look. Well, its name translates to Treaty Greeds, and it's worth about 7,000. A little bit more than a quarter of the value of the platinum door there. But we have to remember there's more to it than just straight value. This is a hematite door. All craft dwarfship is of the highest quality. It is encircled with bands of oval hematite cabochons, and is adorned with hanging rings of eagle leather and menaces with spikes of pigtail. 
On the item is an image of Lurched Post, the giant grizzly bear, and dwarves and hematite. Lurched Post is surrounded by the dwarves. The artwork relates to the rise of the giant grizzly bear, Lurched Post, as an enemy of the Lancer of Oiling in 42. Oh, that's fascinating. That's very cool. Lurched Post, the giant grizzly bear. Very imposing and handy to boot. Well, thank you very much, my friend. Very kind of you to offer it to the fortress. It will find a place of high esteem, to be sure. Just wonderful. Okay. Well, back to fortress work in earnest. Right now, it's the second of Hematite, early summer of 110. We are moving straight along through the year. It's important to note that the elves always arrive in spring, and the humans always show up in summer, so they're going to be coming soon, I would think. The dwarves tend to come in autumn, so we're going to have to be sure to make something for them too, but for now the humans. We'll try to whip something up, but in the meantime I think we should have a bit of a look around Northbridge. Rather, ooh, let's hold up for one second here. Just got word that there's a danger here in the fortress, and uh, yeah, if you have a look over here, we have a goblin thief, a snatcher. It's actually right here in our trade depot. You damn thing. Not too sure what its next move is, but it appears to be running straight into our uh, stockpile room there, just running around like an idiot, getting chased down by one of our guards. Oh, I'm gonna have to lock up this door so they can't escape. Maybe if the alpaca would get out of the way, which it did not. There we go though, okay. Wasn't an issue, but there are others skulking about too. And I was wondering when these creeps would pop up. It was always just a matter of time, really. We got two of them. And there is a third as well, but I don't know if we can catch this one, we'll see. These goblin snatchers come into dwarven fortresses and they steal children specifically, so that they can be indoctrinated, used as warriors for the goblin cause. A cause which is often as shallow as just being murderous, seems to work out pretty well for them. Unfortunately, they're not very good at their jobs, weren't able to get their hands on our children, of which there are a couple in the fortress now. Actually, I think we'll be able to get this one here too. Hey, there we go. Nice work, Salt Bridge squad. You can see they're already growing quite familiar with their spears. These are some skilled dwarves now. Ah, uh, but yes, the goblins. Troublemakers through and through. And this is just a tiny taste of what they're going to have to offer to us. Soon we can expect to see more, and in greater numbers, much greater numbers. Armed goblin squads with weapons, armor, and possibly trained war beasts as well. Well, with any luck, we'll be ready for them. We handled these ones easy enough anyways. Ah, but yes, as I was saying, a quick fortress overview before the humans get here, hopefully. If you have a look over here on the bridge, you can see the main area of our bridge fortress. Still not furnished or anything, we're just trying to get it in place before we start moving in, you know, we don't have a place for the dwarf to live in there yet, so wouldn't be a good idea to get too settled in there. But as you can see, there's that main area up top, and then a bridge leading down to the south, where there's that tunnel that leads below ground. First we'll head up, you can see there's a couple of ramps that go up, wide ramps, to this level right here. Which we're just finishing up now, it's almost entirely walled in. But over on the right side there, we're going to have a trade depot. I figured this would be a good place for it. Sort of right near the entrance to our fortress. The traders can come in up this ramp here, unload all their stuff. And the dwarves can come in from their meeting hall, which is intended to be up here on the third level. We still have to get this all walled in, got to get a roof on and stuff. There's still a lot of work to be done up here, but this right here is intended to be the meeting hall. And it'll get there before long, I'm sure. Gonna look damn fine. And actually, if you look down to the south here, you can see the tower that leads below ground is all covered up. It's got a roof on and everything. Almost, it's almost there. But yeah, good enough. Now, my plan is to have halls snaking off of this top level right here, the meeting hall, leading to different areas of the fortress. And I still don't know how those are gonna be situated exactly. Either along the sides of the bridge or maybe on their own little uh, towers like that below ground tower there. We made a lot of progress this year, so I'm pretty confident that we can start banging stuff out, no problem, as long as we have the claystone blocks. Oh, and actually, before I yammer on too much, let's have a look at this tower over here. Starting at the top, we'll move down, down. Here's the ground floor, and there's going to be a ramp that goes down from here, and I have the sides opened up because I'd like to get windows in there, too. I want to get windows all over this thing. But yes, we can go down, down, down to the bottom. As you can see, we've been replacing the walls with stone blocks, conglomerate stone blocks. Get the job done well enough. Kind of stop that water leaking in. But if we go down from there, you can see the tunnels below. And we have a nice walled in area now. Trying to get it totally walled in too. Got to make the walls that surround it lead all the way up to the ceiling so nothing can creep in. But up to the north there, you can see we have a way out into the tunnels proper. You can put a moat on there, maybe a nice drawbridge. Got a couple workshops out here. It's not too exciting, but it'll be a nice way for us to access the tunnels below the fortress. Looking very good, isn't it? Now then, that was a bit of an overview right there, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to bring things to a rather abrupt ending here, which I don't particularly care for, but I have to put a cap on it at some point, right? Idrathkor, I roll Sazir, is doing absolutely fine. We met some neighbors, made some good trades, and I am damn sure Idrath is very pleased with our progress. 
We got a strong start here, and we will surely become stronger still. Much, much stronger. Just gonna take some time is all. And of course, we're gonna have to be ready for any sort of uh, snags or bumps in the road. I'm sure there'll be quite a few. Now then, we're gonna shift a bit and start talking about some behind the scenes things, like we like to do at the end of the episodes. Also going to be showing off some fan artwork, which I appreciate very much, by the way. And if you're interested in seeing yours displayed, you can send it over to Krugsmash at gmail.com. Just make sure to include what you'd like to be called, as well as a title for the piece, if you like. Just make sure it pertains to this world here, okay? Anywho, yes, quite a productive episode. And as you can see in the background there, um, I've got some footage of the fortress playing. I'm going to let time continue going on a little bit, as long as nothing too exciting goes on. Just so we can get as much done as possible. The progress just feels so good, you know? We might as well try to squish in as much as we can. You know, I heard some dwarves complaining about our bridge here. That's right, believe it or not, we've actually had people wondering why we didn't make an underground bridge, a proper dwarven bridge, a tunnel, right? It'd actually be a lot more efficient than making one above ground like this. But you have to remember, we're trying to make a trade hub here. A hub that's going to do a lot of trades with humans and possibly elves too. And so we want to make it more comfortable for them. You know? They're not tough like us dwarves. They can't really handle all that dank underground air. I put dank in quotes, of course. And so this here is more for them than for us. It'll boost their interest, which will boost our economy. Plus, I mean, look at the place. It's memorable. If we just had some tunnel below ground, nobody's gonna remember that, really. I mean, compared to this, look at it. It's beautiful. It just makes sense. Oh, here's something on a different subject I just thought of. Uh, what's up with cute bulbs? I mention this only because I have kobolds in this episode right here, but it's like whenever they pop up, I get comments about like, why aren't they cute when I draw them? A lot of people seem to like the big floppy eared ones, and I know that's kind of how they look in the game here, but I don't really draw the things like the sprites, so toss that out the window. And like, I, I don't know, I just don't get it. Cute bulbs. Why is it a thing that's associated with Dwarf Fortress kobolds specifically, seemingly? I think it's spread out a little bit more now, but like, I don't know. I've just never found them very engaging. I'm sure the idea of like a cute little thing running around is fun, right? But especially in my series here, I just don't really feel like they meet the uh, aesthetic of the world, you know? Of course, then you have people who wonder why they don't look like D&D &D kobolds either. Little reptilian dragon things. And I mean, if you look at Dungeons and Dragons kobolds, they've changed iterations of kobolds specifically a hundred times over the years. And I kind of think that the Dwarf Fortress ones are based on one of the really early versions of D&D &D kobolds. That right there is one of the things I like about kobolds a lot, is that they don't have a firm cultural depiction, you know? Goblins are kind of like that too, like, it's certainly more firm than with kobolds. But like, say, look at an orc, you know what an orc looks like nine times out of ten in fantasy? Big muscle guy, tusks, barbarian, green, typically. Whereas, you know, there's like a little bit more play with goblins, little green nasty guy, sometimes big nose, sometimes nose slits compare a Pathfinder Goblin to a D&D Goblin nowadays, compare that to a Warhammer Goblin, they're all completely different. But then if you look at, you know, a Kobold, you got a hundred different kinds that kind of just like circle around each other nowadays. You know, you look at a Warcraft Kobold versus a D&D Kobold. One of the first Kobolds I ever remember seeing in fantasy media was from the game Quest 64, in which they appeared to be like a little wolf guy wearing like jeans and a biker vest. That's how I interpreted the design anyways. Super weird, but I mean, again, that's why I like kobolds. You can depict them any way you like. And I mean, really, it's a fantasy people, so like, you could do whatever the hell you want in terms of the design. Just as a showcase of how screwed up my work schedule is sometimes. That last part I just rambled on about, about kobolds, I recorded that a couple days ago before I even drew the goblins for this episode. Talk about divisive. That's a strange design, huh? But again, it's like, why the hell not? Sometimes I'll just start drawing something and just go with it. And it makes it feel more natural to me. Like, I don't choose what the creatures look like in a world. Ultimately, yes, I know I'm the one who finishes a drawing and decides to put that particular drawing into an episode. But there's far less planning than you would think that goes into everything that I do artistically for this uh, YouTube channel, I guess. Like for the goblin, I just sit down and I'm like, okay, I gotta draw a goblin. I didn't know what I was going for till like the last second. And then really you just have a piece of paper. I sketch out some designs in pencil, just a couple of shapes really, like a head shape, a body shape. And then I start filling it in a little bit more again with pencil. And you know, I, like with a professional sort of a deal, you have a concept artist, right, who draws all kinds of different iterations and like, you know, you decide on one at the end, the one that feels right. Well, I don't do that. 
whatever I'm in the mood to draw at that particular moment is what a creature can look like. And it can have big ramifications for my Dwarf Fortress world. Like with the goblins here, these weird little pointy, wolfy, ratty guys. Was the design partially influenced by me talking about the Quest 64 kobolds just now? I don't know. Could be. Could be. Regardless, that's what our goblins look like. And they have purple fur, too. You know, you might be like, oh, they've, they're green, though. They're supposed to be green. Even the, in the game, they're described as being green. Well, it says they have purple hair. So I figured if a goblin is covered with hair, then it would be purple hair, right? The skin beneath would be green. And any exposed skin you'd see, right? That as well would be green. Guys, it's a strange process. I'll admit to that. <laughs> but I have fun with it. And I hope you do, too. Anyways, going to start wrapping things up for real now. Thanks for listening to me ramble. I know it gets kind of disjointed sometimes, but it's like with a drawing. I just go with the flow and hope it works out. And you know, it's gotten me this far, so <laughs> I must be doing something right. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed watching today. And I certainly hope to see you next time here in Idrath Core, I Roll Sazir, a treasure cavern, the North Bridge. And until then, you bearded bastards. <laughs> <laughs>